kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. to start out look here everybody what a way to start our sunset safari with a greater honey guide a juvenile greater honey guide yeah and you can see a beautiful little orange on the breast that stunning little bit of white around the eyes this is just remarkable what a way sorry I'm just gonna enjoy this for a few minutes well because if we do pan away or zoom out from it then it might fly off so and it's something that we don't get to see that often and you can see it is just sitting around here and oh it's oh it's oh it flew back onto this thing isn't that stunning i haven't seen a juvenile i know that uh kerry had one the other day where the little bee eaters was feeding the juvenile because they are brood parasitisms, so oh, off it goes. Wow, 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 what a way to start our sunset safari this afternoon on a beautiful, beautiful Tuesday afternoon. Afternoon, everybody, my name is Cedric. Behind the camera with me on Rusty, we've got Cameron. That is fantastic. I think that is one of the nicest little sightings I've had. Hey, Cam? Yeah. Yeah. First and for me, I've first, never seen one. you've never seen one, eh? Yeah. So, that, so Cam can at least mark that down on his uh, checklist and all that. But wow, what a way to start. But just joining us this afternoon on our safari on Wendy, we're going to have Kerry and Panda and our amazing team there in Johannesburg. But uh, our director for the afternoon is Gwen, second director Chulu, and our tech is Sips, and our tech guru this side is Showmax. It's live, it's interactive, so please, if you want to chat to us, go on to hashtag Wild Earth, Wild Earth on Twitter or X, or just go on to our Wild Earth app or the website. Make sure you do register so you can send those comments and questions through to us this afternoon. Okay, so my plan for the afternoon, I'm on the western boundary. I said I was going to try and follow up on Tortoise Pan. Let's get going. Let's get going. So Tortoise Pan was moving north this morning from the south. That beautiful male leopard. So if you don't know who Tortoise Pan is, he's a beautiful male leopard, my favorite leopard around here. And uh, he was coming north from another property coming into Juma. And I'm just taking a look at his uh, typical route at the moment. Here. No tracks coming up here because he usually will come up this road here on Zoe's. But uh, I haven't seen anything as of yet. So I might just go end up going around towards the southern boundary just to make sure he hasn't come through. Oh, Claire from the UK, thank you. Oh, that'll be fantastic. If I can get tortoise pan today, I'll be so happy. <laughs> I'll be very, very happy. Now I do miss uh, seeing that beautiful male leopard. Absolutely love him. He's just such a tank and uh, so relaxed and oh, I just love him. Yeah. So let's see if we get lucky with him. Um, you never know, you never know, because I know that he takes this side. So well, as I said, southern side, go look around there. As well as I might end up going to a Treehouse Dam, because Treehouse Dam is one of the dams as well that's not too far from here. On a very hot afternoon like this, I think uh, dams will be fantastic to do. Um, we might get a, once again another stunning elephant uh, pool party like that we had yesterday afternoon. So. I'll head up to that uh, dam just to go and uh, pop my nose in there to see maybe we get lucky with other things around that side. You never know what uh, the afternoon brings, but what a way to start with a greater honey guide. Oh my word. Paul, yeah, it's going to be an epic drive. If it's starting off with a greater honey guide, it's going to be fantastic. I think we're going to have a great day, great afternoon out here in the bush. And thanks once again for joining pretty much, uh, well, it is the largest live safari vehicle in the world. And everybody 
sitting back and uh, yes as I say sit, send questions and comments let us know what you uh, want to know about the wildlife or if you got any suggestions on something let us know all right bush is still very thick had a bit of rain last night so things are kind of quite vibrant at the moment all the butterflies around here We'll see if we can get one or two insects on drive this afternoon as well. Um, so it'll be also quite a nice thing to do and try and do a little bit of a, a insect search. I'm not the greatest at insects and all that. I'm not like a Taylor. Taylor's fantastic. She knows her insects are very well from back to front. Always nice to listen to her the stories on uh, insects and all that. But uh, yeah, I've got everybody at home joining in. So. You know, if I don't know something, somebody somewhere will know something. That's what's fantastic. We all interact with one another. That's what it's about. We all learn. I just want to see something there. No, sorry, I thought I saw something that side, but uh, my heart almost uh, dropped down. To my toes there I thought it was like a <laughs> rosette lying in the tree I think see this is when you know you need to go and leave when you start seeing things I'm starting to see see things again I don't know my comms is so soft though. maybe it's just my earpiece I'm gonna double check my earpiece there quickly sometimes it comes through very loud or comes very, very soft All right, Wendy will be out very shortly. They're just quickly getting her ready. Of course, Kerry can't wait to get out as well. You know that she wants to get into the bush and uh, show you some amazing things for the afternoon. All right, let's get to the southern side. Yeah, we're almost getting to that side. As I said, that's what I want to just take a look around here. Yeah. Maybe a giraffe, kudu, impalas, maybe some more birds. Let us know. Just let us know what you'd like to see. Nothing. There. There's usually a beautiful lilac breasted roller that hangs around you. And, um, all right, well, we're going to sit here and, oh, there's one up there. But uh, we'll quickly go and take a look at the weather today while we try and frame up on this lilac breasted roller. go the lilac breasted roller on a very hot day you can see even the beak is uh, open so you'll find when uh, birds get quite hot during the daytime they'll open their beaks just to try and regulate the temperature and uh, try and keep a little bit cool still very interesting fact as well at the moment for us uh, we still haven't seen one European roller yet I think this might be the first time in uh, my 17 years working in the Sabi Sands in the uh, Greater Kruger National Park that I haven't seen a European roller by Feb. Very interesting and I know that uh, BirdLife South Africa they were busy with a, a project on the European rollers on the migrant patterns and what is changing it at the moment. Very interesting. But now this uh, roller species, the, the species, the lilac breasted roller, uh, this one does not migrate. It will be uh, throughout the year. So it's not my, it's not a migrant bird. Of course, they do enjoy sitting always on the dead trees or right on top of a bush. Um, they're always quite, pretty much in the open. And it's one of the most photographed bird. In Africa because of the coloration and because they're always right in the open areas and all that so it's easy for a photographer to just to kind of sit back and uh, take amazing photos and especially when the light 
the sunlight is hitting it perfectly and it really kind of the colors really pop out quite a bit with a green on the head beautiful lilac breast hence the name the blues and apparently they've got eight different colorations on the bird eight so this so it's green lilac blue uh, brown white I'll go five there purple what's the other one's like a turquoise or dark blue what is that maroon so they say maroon maroon let's go with maroon on the shoulders looks like there's like a bit of a maroonish color there black of course forgot about black and I'm missing one more color one more color maybe the legs what color is the legs it's like a gray oh we're gray huh yeah, should be gray now let's go with gray all right there we go eight eight colors yeah, yeah I did say white no no white I said white right in the beginning yeah uh, good so yeah they got the so eight colors here we go I'm a bit worried about the maroon um, I'm not too sure about the maroon oh, what's it's a deep blue what is deep blue Navy blue, navy blue. Maybe that's just blue, but no, I'll just say navy blue. There's two different, it's like electric blue and navy blue there. This is On Safari. particular case it looks like he's made a coalition with his sons. I'm sure this afternoon is going to be a fantastic drive as always. Now remember this is live and interactive so we'd love to hear from you. Hello, good afternoon everybody. We found ourselves in Nyala Bull here. Have a look. It's busy feeding in the shade. Very clever of him. It's a nice warm day today. Had some lovely rain last night which was very refreshing. The morning was rather cool and crisp, fresh and clean. But it has warmed up quite a lot. Look at that sky clouds have all disappeared and the sun is out 
Hello again everyone, my name is Kerry if you're just joining us behind me on the camera today we have Panda and uh, we are just bumbling along seeing what we can find today. Uh, we are planning to head kind of to the western border of Juma and yeah, I'll go into one of the, the neighboring reserves that we're allowed to go on to and see what might be there. See what's bobbing around. It is very warm. We're also going to be looking along the way if we can find any tracks, any fresh tracks of any predators. Giraffe. We had a giraffe on our highlights today, so I'd like to find a giraffe, would be pretty cool. The zebra also have disappeared very quickly, so maybe we can see if we can follow up on some zebra. So that nyala is not in the best light there. There's two bulls that were here just now. Anyways, we're gonna carry on. I like that handle, Cheeky Baby Ellie. That is a pretty cool handle you got there, Cheeky Baby Ellie. Um, yeah, it's really lovely afternoon. Thank you for joining us again. And uh, yeah, looking forward to what we're gonna find this afternoon. All right, ready to make our way, Panda. Ready to rock and roll. Ready to see what's out there. Oop, of course, the Nyala decided to look at us now. Hello. All right, all right. Just trying to see if we could find any marulas. This tree is completely free of marulas. There's not a single marula left under that tree there. It's interesting how some of the marula trees, there's a few with marula trees that still have a few fruit underneath and other marula trees are completely barren of marulas. They've been wiped up by everything. The elephants, the nyala, the kudu, all gone. I tried eating one yesterday and I must say they are full of moisture, a lot of water in there. As soon as you open it, the whole thing just almost explodes in your mouth. Lots of liquid coming out. Um, I was trying to describe what the marillas do taste like. It's a very interesting taste, but it definitely has a lychee feel to it. Like, you know, when you bite into that lychee and again, all the liquid comes out. So a very creamy kind of interesting taste the marillas have. In the late afternoons, if it's been a hot day like today, you can actually smell the marillas, like nice sweet smell. If you drive under a tree that still has a lot of marillas left there, so it's always a nice smell. Clouds have all gone, it was nice and overcast this morning. So Joey, there's actually quite a few things that are edible for humans that are, are in the bush. If you know what you're looking for, then you could definitely find quite a few little bush snacks or bush tucker. Um, there's, at the moment, I haven't seen any for a while. When I was here, kind of middle of January, there were some sour plums that were still fruiting. But again, a bit of a bittery kind of taste. I think I did eat one on one of the drives and yeah, definitely left a nasty bitter taste in my mouth for a while. Um, Paul and uh, Panda and I were actually talking about that the other day, like our favorite bush fruit. So got the sour plums, you've got the marulas at the moment. Um, there's also a, a bunch of quite dried berries. So the one berry, we call it, you know one of the names for it is a mi or the bird plum, which also you can either eat it fresh or you can eat, eat it when it's dried both ways. They, either like eating grapes fresh or eating raisins, kind of that's a good comparison. That's also nice one. I've seen one tree around here. It's also something quite nice to eat. Um, and let me think, what other fruit do we have that is edible? We're kind of coming beginning of the summer season. So rainy season is always the best season kind of in most African um, uh, kind of parks and reserves to find these edible fruit. Um, I know of a chocolate berry in Zimbabwe. We get a, a fruit called the chocolate berry, which is quite nice. It leaves your whole mouth completely black um, and you either love it or you hate it. It's definitely got a very interesting taste. Do you like the chocolate berry, Panda? Yeah. You like them? Yeah. Okay. 
you know, it just leaves you your mouth is just slightly discolored so that's it's also a pretty good one what's your favorite bush fruit funda Sour plums. Again, if you get the right color, yeah. right, because they're orange, but they can also, there's another species that's also red. And if you get them when they're at the right, uh, if you pick them at the right stage when they properly ripe, then they can be quite nice. But nine times out of ten, you might pick the wrong one. Oh, wow, it's a very bitter taste. It definitely dries out your whole mouth for a while, right? Yeah. <laughs> very. very. Okay, another fruit from Zimbabwe that I didn't quite get here. Hmm, Brandon, I would say it's pretty much a 50-50 kind of thing. Um, <laughs> we were talking about the other day, yesterday, how all bush fruit have their own taste, so you can't compare it to anything. So a lot of the fruit that we know of is, is always sweet and has a good taste, whereas a lot of bush fruit, again, is touch and go. I know the uh, uh, Ilala palm. Have you ever had a porridge made from the Ilala palm, Panda? So the Ilala palm, which is this giant big palm tree, and they have these big hard fruits that the elephant like to eat. And what you can do is you can peel the hard shell off. There's a little bit of a hard shell when it's still in its light brown color. And you can actually grate off that powder that's around the seed and you can make a porridge out of that. Or you can if you want to. I mean, baboons eat it all the time. I've seen porcupines feeding it on it. Um, I've eaten them quite a few times, but again, it's definitely a very weird texture. It leaves a lot of interesting things in your teeth for a while. So a lot of the bush fruit, I guess they would take a while to get used to if that's all we had to feed on, all we had to eat. But I'll definitely go for, um, I'll definitely go for some nice grapes that are very juicy. I mean, I got introduced the other day to, what is it? Candy cane grapes. Isn't that crazy? Like how you can change the flavor of grapes. So I'll definitely go for uh, fruit from the uh, from the shops. I much, much prefer to eat some fruit from the shops. But every now and then it is nice to eat a familiar fruit that you have in the bush. We are bringing you a new and improved fan favorite. We have unearthed the finest gems from over the years in our archives to give you hours of amazing entertainment. Hop on the largest safari vehicle in the world and revisit the best of Wild Earth with epic moments from eco-training pride lands, memories from Madikwe, and more. Reconnect with your favorite naturalists and animal characters with the best of safari life. Wild Earth, connecting with nature.
All right, so I left the area. Unfortunately, I, I'd looked on the southern uh, boundary. No leopard tracks coming over as of yet. I'm sure that male leopard, uh, tortoise pan, must still be in the south, just south of uh, Juma. So we'll keep our eyes, ears, nose, everything peeled for later on. Maybe he'll come in north. But for now, I've just decided to park Cameron and myself and old Rusty in a nice a shady spot as it's very hot this afternoon here yeah, at the tree house at dam one of the beautiful dams around here and as you can see we've got some male impalas that's just roaming around there in the background as they're finding a little bit of shade for the afternoon We'll take a look around what else we can find at the dam while we sit here. I'm sure we can get some nice bird species. Right, we've got a beautiful woodland kingfisher that keeps on diving here. This is going to test Cam a bit. Hopefully, in, in the shade, so you're right, and <laughs> you'll, you'll you'll do it. So we've got a beautiful woodland kingfisher here. Look at this stunning woodland kingfisher, and it keeps on diving into the water. So let's see if we can get the dive. That... <laughs> <laughs> it does, it kind of well played. <laughs> yeah, it did well. It's it's so tricky to really get your timing right there with this bird. That's gonna you never know because it doesn't give you a warning sign. You think it's busy preening itself, and next moment it just takes off. Mm. Okay, I give and take. Let's see. Sometimes I'll dive into the water to try and. Here we go. Oh, Cam. Cam, you legend. Well done. <laughs> you caught that one perfect. Well done. I wasn't too close, haven't I? No, but yeah, no, well, that's well done. Jasmine, yes, nice birding for the afternoon so far. It was nice just watching the woodland kingfisher. Yeah, I know that. So you'll just wait for it to come back, yeah. <laughs> I make the viewers nauseous. <laughs> it's like watching a tennis game. <laughs> Ah, uh, it's going beyond there. Oh well, anyway, that's uh, that was that was a uh, that was a lot of fun. I think that was nice just to kind of take a look at some some birding like that. But uh, we got to see what else we can see. I'm going to get my binocs out. Always important on a safari, bring your binoculars with you when you get to the dam. Then you always just grab those binoculars, look around, see what you can see. Make sure that you're also nice and hydrated, especially on hot afternoons like this. Uh, looks like we've got some Egyptian geese on the other side, or only one a goose on the other side here. Yeah. It's a busy preening itself. Mm. Kimberly, I think so. I think well done to K Cam on that one. That's right. So there's his thumb. It was just his, his thumb. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was. It's very difficult. I really take my hat off for the cam ops that really frame up on birds. I think birds, I think it was in Paul the other day, we asked him what's the most difficult thing to uh, film on camera. And he said there was two things. Funny enough, the hippo was the one thing. Couldn't believe it. He said, well, the hippo is the one thing. And the second thing was birds, you know, birds in flight. He said, it's very, very difficult. Oh, well, we even got a... Swainson's Franklin coming down towards Egyptian geese. I wonder if they're not going to chase it off. Sometimes they are quite territorial over their water. Seems I'm not too bothered about the Frank. I mean, I might say Franklin Spurfowl. Used to be a, used to be known as a Franklin many many years ago. You know, well, we're going to sit here and, uh, well, it is that time of the afternoon once again and it's the kids' uh, drive that is around, or well, it's about to start. So let's go and, yeah, start the kids' show.
Good afternoon kids from Hurst Green Primary School in the UK, ages four to six. We want to welcome you onto our safari this afternoon. My name is Kerry and I'm with a uh, panda who is our cameraman today and our noble steed is called Wendy on Rusty which is the other game viewer that's also on safari this afternoon we have Cameron who's behind the camera and Cedric who is our other guide we are really excited for you to join us this afternoon and we can't wait to see what we can find for you we, we did have a little stenbok, which is a tiny little antelope, but unfortunately he didn't want to wait around for us and he took off into the bushes. So I think I'm going to start and make our way and we'll see what else we can find along the way, kids. I hope you enjoy the afternoon safari with us. What are we going to find today? What are we going to find? I feel like I'm in the mood for a zebra. Are you in the mood for panda? Lucy, so we go out on safari every day, so in the morning and in the evening. So from 6 a.m. until 9 a.m. and then from 4 p.m. until 7 p.m. every day. So anytime you want to join us on safari, we are here. So you can ask your parents to switch on the TV for you or find us on YouTube. Just ask them for Wild Earth and join us on safari because we're here every day. And we want to show you what amazing animals we have. Let's see, let's see what's waiting for us. Anything out there? It's very hot today, kids. So maybe we'll get some we had some elephants the other day swimming in the one of the watering holes while it was very hot so maybe we'll get some luck with some elephants swimming today so we always keep a, a good eye out for any tracks when we come to any big roads or junctions like this because lots of animals leave tracks behind on the road and that helps us find them Let's go over to the weather kits and see what our weather is looking like for today. nice is it to start the kids a show and uh, yeah we've got a beautiful antelope here and this is a male impala also known as an impala ram got two of them there's one that's hiding behind one of the bushes there a little bit of a younger one oh, it looks like he's not too camera friendly i think he's just shy yeah, he is shy in that one. Oh, he pops out there. But yes, I'm looking forward to this afternoon's uh, kids' uh, drive. And uh, my name is uh, Cedric. And behind the camera with me on a rusty, we've got Cameron. Thank you for joining us. And I'm hoping that we're going to get some fantastic questions and comments from all of you. So we are going to just uh, try and look around here. Oh, they are in the open now. Two young Impala Rams, not the oldest of ones. You can just see the horns, not that big yet so maybe like i say two years two three years old these two males these little young boys the horns are still going to curve a little bit more but aren't they beautiful just walking along the water's edge here nibbling at all the nice young little leaves on the bushes oh also leaving its scent there as well you can see sometimes they'll just rub their face and there's a little gland just underneath the eye where they'll actually leave a scent behind there. There we go. Maybe I had, also maybe I had a little bit of an itch. Amy and Araya, this is the animal that we see the most. This one. This is the Impala. 
Yes, if we go on a safari without seeing an impala, well then it would be a little bit of a problem. There's two big ones that's just approaching, so you've got two young males, and then you've got on the back there, on the left hand side, you've got the two older males. You can see their horns much bigger. Beautiful. As you can see, just walking around there. Oh, isn't that stunning? And there's no crocodiles in here. Oh, look at the poor male at the back. His horns are broken. There's a male at the back there, so he's got two broken horns. You see that? Yeah. So maybe sometimes they'll break their horns by when they're sparring. In other words, when the two males are competing for females, sometimes uh, the competition and the fights can be quite vicious. And uh, maybe he broke his horns due to fights that he's had in the past. So, but they've broken exactly at the same spot, both of them. Very interesting. Okay, well the one on the right a little bit lower. Wow. Well that is not going to be good for him because if he has to fight for females again, he hasn't got those big long horns. In other words, he's, he's not going to have the advantage. He's going to have the pretty much like a disadvantage to any little bit of a fight that he's going to be going around. So that's exactly, I think, uh, not a good thing for him. But they will just stick together. And why you see males together, we'll call this a bachelor herd. So males together, bachelor herd. And why they staying together is because it's a safety. So the more eyes and ears that you've got together around you, the better chance of survival, a better chance of seeing a predator that is approaching you. move on I think uh, we've sat here for long enough and it's time to go and 
venture out and to go and see what else we can go and find. Let's go and see. Well, Uh, sorry, Gwen, your comms is breaking up. I just said Eli something. That's it. Um, I did not get that question at all. Ooh, sorry. Alrighty. Let's see what else we can. Oh. What's that? Oh, it says impalas. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, saw something moving in front of me, but it was impalas that came through here now. There they are. Hello. Oh, hello. Where's another one without the horns? Should be coming out next. I think he's already gone past. Okay. He's already gone past. So we're going to go and see if we can check out one of the watering holes that's close by and see if we can maybe find some elephants or any animals down there. It's a hot day. If I was an elephant, I would want to go down to the watering hole and have a nice splash in the water, have a swim. So let's head over to the watering hole and see what's there, what's waiting for us. Oop, little dove on the road. See lots of Elephant dung on the road from last night. Uh, so Malia, the hardest animal to spot, um, probably going to be a leopard. I mean, all animals have very good camouflage, so they can blend into the environment very easily if they just lie down. But leopards are very difficult to see. Um, a pangolin, I've never seen a pangolin in southern Africa, so that's also a very difficult one to see but that's because not only do they blend in really well but they're also an endangered species so that means that they, there are not many pangolin left in Africa so it's very difficult to see them because there's so few of them. An aardvark, so a lot of the animals, an aardvark is like an, an anteater so he's like kind of looks like a, an, an armadillo or I'd say a pangolin looks more like an armadillo, but a kind of weird pig-looking creature with a long tail and funny long snout. But again, they also come out at night. So I'd say a lot of animals that do come out at night can also be very difficult to find because we're all sleeping when they come out. So yeah, I'd say a lot of the nocturnal species. So that means the species that come out at night. All right, just arriving at the watering hole here called twin dams we having a look if there's anything here we've got a little whoa, and off he goes a little blacksmith lapwing just took off there but we've got our weavers maybe we can go and check out our weavers so nothing happening So Theo, I think the biggest animal I've ever seen, of course, has to be the largest land mammal that we have here, and that is a giraffe. Tallest, biggest giraffe and an elephant will be the two largest mammals that I've ever seen. Let's go have a look here. We've got some really cool little birds down here. They're called weavers, the masked weaver, and they're busy building their nests at the moment so that they can have little eggs and little chicks inside. Let's see what these weavers are doing. They're very busy birds, so making a lot of noise. They have a very beautiful sound. Let's see these weavers here. Hello, anybody home? Some terrapin might be here too. We saw some terrapin the other day. Oh, there we go. There's a few weavers here, Panda. They're a bit quiet today though. The other day we had lots of them all over the place. See these little masked weavers? You can see their nests there that's just above the water. And they make their nests above the water like that to protect their eggs and their babies from any snakes or predators. 
this little patch of water is also really good to find. We saw a water monitor walking across here the other day and I keep thinking one of our Cameron who is behind the camera with Cedric is dying to see an African rock python which is a snake. It's a very big snake and I think that this would be a nice place to see an African rock python. They like water like this in marshy areas. I'm going to try and listen kids if you can hear these weavers. They're very quiet today unfortunately though. Look that's a little male. Let's have a listen see if we can hear them. Oh, they're very quiet today, Vanda. Different to the yeah, other day. Quiet. The other day they were making so much noise we could barely even hear ourselves thinking while we were here. So it seems like the females are not here. It's just two, what, three or four little males. So these birds actually make. So Maya, yes, so the ba most baby animals will stay with their parents for a few years until they're big and strong enough to look after themselves or until their family might push them out of the group. So like with elephants, young elephant bull, when they um, grow up and become big and strong enough, then uh, what the, they will do is they'll then be pushed out of the group. So kind of like with humans, when you finish school and you're now like over the age that you should be going and finding your own job and making your own house. Your parents sometimes, if you're lucky, they'll let you stay at home, but sometimes they kind of make you, yeah, you know, encourage you to go out into the world and do your own thing and find a job and your own place. So same with the uh, little elephants. Eventually the females will always stay in the group because they need to all breed and have babies and stay together for protection. But the bulls, they need to at some stage go off and do their own thing. So these little weavers. So they actually make these nest kids with their beaks. So what they'll do is they'll fly across and fetch some pieces of reed, fly back and they'll use their hang on with their feet upside down, which is quite funny to watch them sometimes because sometimes they bob about upside down and then they use their bill to actually make the nest weaving the grass in and out, in and out. All right, I think. Let me have a look. What's going on there? Just gonna have on the look on the other side. There's a little pond here. Hang on, I'll just check first, Panda. I don't want you to move in case it's. I think I can see a little terrapin, but I'm not. Okay, I'm gonna move forward, Panda, because on the left-hand side we've got a little terrapin, which is pretty cool. Just going to move forward for you because there's a bit of grass there. So a little terrapin is like a, a water tortoise or a turtle, an African turtle. Instead of being in the ocean, these terrapins live in... Oh, he's gone down, but maybe he's going to pop up for us. Let's see where this little terrapin is going to pop up out of the water. These little terrapins, they don't live in the ocean, so they'll live in water and dams and ponds. Just gonna reverse here so we can get a bit of a better angle. Oop, there we go. There, a little terrapin popped up there. See his little nose sticking out of the water. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. So we had a lot of rain last night and must have. Oop. Sorry if we had a little bit of a break in picture, kids. Our my signal wasn't good. Whoop, there he is. So because of all the rain we had last night, I think there was, meant there were a lot of insects around. So this morning I saw lots of terrapins on the one dam. I counted nine or ten of them. So it's very difficult to see, but you can see his little nose sticking out of the water. You can kind of see the reflection or the shadow of his body too. This tiny little terrapin. Very cute. But these things are not shouldn't be messed with because if you are ever on safari and you find a terrapin I would not suggest picking them up because they have a very bad smelling urine so their, their wee has a very bad smell and uh, 
if that gets on your hands, whew, it's gonna be very bad. <laughs> yeah, that smell will stay on your hands for quite some time. Oh, there's another one popped up on the left. And hoping our little maybe a python or something else might pop out while we're watching this terrapin. We can't keep calm when our teams are on. It's time to huddle around tracks and trails for the wildest Super Bowl. Gear up for a competitive weekend on safari as our naturalists across locations compete to spot the most animal species. Go to our X page and poll the team you're behind. Get your game faces on and watch it live. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. Isn't this guy cute? So I love tortoises and terrapins when they're in their shell and you're not expecting them to poke their head out and all of a sudden they poke their head out of the shell and you get a huge big fright because you weren't expecting something to come out of the shell there. Look at him, he's actually moving on top of the reeds. So this little pan has a lot of reeds and this terrapin is actually using the reeds to move on top. So it's helping him to move across the pan. A little bit of activity with the weavers, they're making a bit more noise now. Oh. Wonder where he's going to this little terrapin. He's probably going to look for something to eat. These are weavers calling. Hello. Yes, I'm here with a beautiful tree, a stunning tree, one of my favorites. Soft, no thorns. Well, if it had thorns, 
clearly I will not be doing this at this point of time. So this is a beautiful tree called the African Weeping Wattle. It's a part of the wattle family. And what's nice about these trees is it's like almost like so, as soft as a fern, the leaves. Very, very soft. So I believe sometimes with survival stuff in the bush. So if you're in the bush and you do not have certain things like, for instance, maybe toilet paper to blow your nose or tissues to blow your nose. You've got nothing. Now you need to blow your nose. Your nose is running. What do you do? First thing I'll do is come to look for this tree, the African weeping wattle. The leaves are very soft, so we're going to just take some of the older leaves off. The ones that's going to be falling off very soon. Just, just going to take, thank you tree, for your kind leaves. Take them, they're very soft, and you can actually blow your nose. And then of course discard the tree, or the leaf, and it's natural. Very, very natural. So this is also known as a toilet paper tree. Well, you can understand why toilet paper. Well, it's soft, very, very soft. Now, the lot of people around here in Southern Africa, because the wood inside is beautiful, it's got like a maroon color. So a lot of people, if they make something inside their house, like uh, chairs or tables or ornaments, window frames, something like that, a lot of people will use the African weeping wattle wood because it's got that beautiful maroon color, like a reddish color to the wood. And it really looks quite pretty for the ornaments or for the chairs and tables inside the house. I love, love these trees. Now, why do they call it an, a weeping wattle? Now, you know weeping? Weeping is crying. So weeping. So what happens is because there's a certain bug, a beetle, like a bug, called the spittle bug spit spittle bug and it actually sits on the branches and it actually draws the sap from the branch itself draws some of the sap out of it the juices out of the tree and then it creates like a foam and it starts dripping so if you've got a lot of this on top like on these big trees big african weeping wattle trees and it starts dripping with like the, the saliva or the the juice of the spittle bug it looks like the tree is busy weeping, busy crying. So that's where the name comes, African Weeping Wattle. Sorry, I just heard some crunching something behind you. <laughs> Luckily I've got Cam there, he'll warn me I'm sure. And so yes, mm, Cynthia. Cynthia, yes, oh, Cynthia, yes, they grow this side. I'm not too sure the distribution of the African weeping wattle. Very, I'm not too sure, but definitely in the low felt, this area, Mapumalanga, to the Limpopo area, the African weeping wattle is quite popular, very, very common around this side. Um, I think as well, a little bit further down, if I'm not mistaken, I think in some areas in the Cape as well, you'll get the African weeping wattle, but don't go on to my words there, but I know in this area, so fortunately I won't know exactly the entire distribution of this tree. But yes, beautiful, beautiful tree. The African weeping wattle. Well, I don't want to waste these leaves because it's a hot day. Sometimes you can actually just put there like a little bit of shade, like shading cloth. You see? You can put a little bit of shading cloth on there. There we go. Which way is the sun? That side. Driving this side. Right, there we go. So I can protect my face. All right, let's go. Here we go. We've got a little bit of a protection for the afternoon, as well as in case maybe my nose starts running or I start crying or something. At least I can use the African weeping wattle to wipe my tears or blow my nose. All right, let's go. Wonderful. Let's see what we can find. I think I'm trying to look at some of the mud wallows. It's a very important mud wallows. The mud wallow is like the little pans. That's, there's a lot of mud inside of it. So things like your elephants, your rhinos, your buffalo, your warthogs, they love those mud wallows because what happens, they can actually cake their skin full of mud to protect it from the sun. Just like what I'm using the African weeping wattle for, the leaves. That's what the uh, buffaloes, elephants, rhinos and warthogs use to protect their skin, is mud. 
All right, let's go this side. Riley, you're asking, is it nice in Africa? Riley, it is wonderful. I love, love South Africa. I was born and bred here, and I even went to the UK for like a, a couple, like almost like a couple of years, but uh, they asked me to stay on there, and I said, no, but this is many years ago. I said, no, I want to go back to Africa because I miss the bush. I miss this, I miss this. This is what it's about for me. So it's a lovely, the weather's fantastic. Yes, it can get hot. It depends on what kind of person you are. So you're, if you are a winter person, well then Africa, well this area, it's, it's very hot. Your winter time just gets a cold, but there's no snow and things like that. So it depends on what kind of person you are. If you enjoy those things, then you, yeah, maybe go up north somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> where the snow is, but not, not, not yeah. Uh, well, then again, you can actually go to Cape Town, not Cape Town, but the Drakensberg. There's some places that get snow. I, I saw snow this winter, but I did not touch it. Can you believe it? I still haven't felt snow in my life. Never, no, never touched snow in my life. I want to make a snowman. Mm. I really want to make a snowman. And then I want to put the carrot, it's like the nose in. Sorry, Gwen, you said it snowed in at the office, inside the office. I'm not understanding. Sorry, Gwen, you're not, not making sense there. Sorry, go again. Gwen is our director, so I'm just trying to see what she's saying. Oh, uh, this. Oh, that's right, this winter, I think. I think it snowed this winter. Okay, so Gwen said it snowed at the, close to the office recently. Hmm. That's nice. Did you go make a snowman, Gwen? Any snowmen? Not really. Hmm. <laughs> I think Gwen says you couldn't even put any snow in the cup. That's how little it was. snow there was. I don't even think you can call that snow then. That's a sleet. I didn't call that sleet. <laughs> Alright, watch the aerial. Ooh. Sorry, the long aerial at the back. Jake, have I ever seen a leopard? Uh, no, Jake, that is on my bucket list. Definitely want to see a leopard. No, I'm just joking, Jake. Uh, we are very fortunate here to see leopards. Very fortunate. Yeah, in the Sabi Sand, where we are now, yeah, Juma, or in the Sabi Sand itself, itself, is very well renowned. It's very well known for seeing leopards. So, so Jake, um, you know, if I have to really put a number down on how many leopards I've seen in uh, 17 years here in the Greater Kruger Park, uh, Jake, I don't know. I think. Oh, I'd love to, I'd love to tell you that up. And look, it'll be past easy, three, four thousand, five thousand leopards, uh, easy. If you think about one leopard per day, 365 days a year, okay, let's take some off, but you must also add some. Sometimes we see three or four leopards per day. So, yeah, I don't know, a lot, a lot of leopard. So we're going to find one for you guys this afternoon, Jake, I think. I've got a feeling about it. I need to, so. Tortoise Pan is calling my name that side, so I am going to slowly head into that direction. Um, uh, just need to get my comms going. So if you hear my radio, I need my radio to be on because Kerry is not here. So my radio needs to be on due to we give information between guides on what we're seeing. Just letting my director know. Because if my radio is not on, I might miss out on sightings and information that I need. Thank you. All right.
please got any comments or questions send them through I'm waiting I'm here to answer anything or explain something let's see all right well we're gonna continue see if maybe we're lucky with uh, that male leopard let's head over to Kerry to see what's happening on Chitwa Love is in the air, and where there is love, there is life. Keep your lover close and jump on safari as we celebrate Valentine's Day. From mating to courtship dances, our expert naturalists will search for all the signs of love in the wild. Join us this romance season. Hello, are you Mr. and Mrs. Roller? Wild Earth, it's in your nature. So have a look here. He has this crocodile. It's just popped up. So a perfect dinner or lunch or a meal for a crocodile. If that water bucket doesn't be careful, a crocodile like this big could definitely take down a little baby water buck. So what the crocodiles do, kids, is actually they'll hide in the water. I mean, look, we didn't even know he was there. So they'll go down in the water and hide in the water. And when antelope come down to to drink then they'll kind of launch themselves out of the water to grab the antelope of course the antelope will be so busy drinking they're not paying attention so the crocodile just has to has to come out of the water at the right time and grab onto their, their snout their nose and then they pull them into the water but crocodiles have quite a variety of food that they eat so they'll also when they're smaller so small baby crocodiles also feed on insects and baby fish. Theo, the coolest animal that I have seen, I must say, has to be a bongo. I saw a bongo in the Congo. And a bongo is pretty much like a kind of like a kudu in the same family as kudu and nyala. So it's like a female nyala, so brown with white stripes and it has long spiraled horns, males and females, just like the male nyala. Very beautiful antelope, very big. And that is my favorite antelope that I've seen so far. That's the coolest antelope. I think it's pretty cool the way he looks too. Oh look at this crocodile, isn't he super cool? So a big crocodile like this would also probably feed on, on fish sometimes if there's any 
They are also opportunistic hunters, and that means that anything that comes by that they might see a chance to eat, they definitely eat, so they could also feed on birds. And of course they scavenge too, so if anything does die in the water, then they will definitely go for that as well. Oh, this crocodile, look, it looks like he's eyeing out that little water buck. I don't think he's going to be lucky today because the water buck already know that he's there. But it's interesting because the water buck just crossed the water over here and that's what kind of must have woken this crocodile up and made him realize that there's some antelope around. Now he's come right to the place where these water buck are. So when I go home on my holiday, kids often will go um, to the Zambezi and the Zambezi River has a lot of crocodiles in and uh, yeah, it's very dangerous in that water. Sometimes if you put your feet in the water and just sit there for a little bit, after a few minutes you end up seeing a crocodile pops up close by. So yeah, my dad does not like it when we go close to the water, when we are near the river because these crocodile are very clever. They can pick up noise in the water from very far away and uh, yeah they use the element of surprise next thing you might be surprised to have a crocodile right in front of you Whoop. so there's looks like there's a lot of swirls of some big fish around here so this crocodile might also feed on big fish but when crocodiles are babies um, there's a lot of things that eat a baby crocodile so it takes a does take a long time for these crocodiles to get this size and they do have to also be careful of a lot of other predators. Isn't those water buck cool there? You can hear the hippos as well. Let's have a look at those hippos again, panda. There's a few more of them out the water. It's nice to see such a big family of hippos like this, a big pod. You can see there's a big male in the middle there, one male. So Ronnie, hippos actually feed on grass. So what hippos do is, obviously you can see they've got a lot of pink color on their skin there. So they'll wait, Whoop. they'll wait until it's nightfall, or sometimes if you're lucky on an overcast cool day, they'll come out of the water. They'll actually feed on the grass on the by the shoreline. In some watering holes during the rainy season. I mean, they have a lot of water close by for the hippos, but when it dries out in the dry season, um, it's difficult for the hippos to get food. So hippos can actually walk up to 20, 30 kilometers away from water in order for them to find food. And you never want to get in the way of a hippo and the water that he lives in because he will not be happy. These hippo are in the perfect place. I must say, aren't you jealous of these hippos, Panda? I wish I could also be in the water. Just wish we could just jump into this water, but with that crocodile around, mm, it's not safe to be anywhere near the water. Oh, wow. Yeah, we just, Panda just saw him pop up there near the reeds. You can't even see him. He just looks like a log. So a lot of the time, that's also how crocodiles go undetected as they blend in very well and just looks like they could log floating in the water. I mean, look at that. Isn't this super cool? We've got a crocodile here. We've got water buck, big pod of hippo. Lots happening at this dam here. Love this dam. It's a beautiful day. Oop, check his body. He might come out the water for us. What's happening there? Oh, wow, check at that, kids. So crocodiles, kids, they are ectothermic. So that means that they're not like us, that we can kind of control our body temperature and by putting on a jacket if we're cold or... So hippos, or crocodiles, need to come out of the water and lie in the sun. So they absorb heat through the sun and that's how they regulate their body temperature. So during the day, hippo, or crocodiles will go and lie on a bank somewhere try and absorb as much heat as possible so that their body temperature will be warm enough during the night. So that's why during the day you can find crocodiles on little beaches 
near the water and that's also where crocodiles will lay their eggs so it's pretty cool crocodiles do lay eggs they can lay anything from about 9 to 22 eggs at, at one time and they will dig a hole in the sand and bury their eggs in this hole and then the female crocodile will protect that nest so she'll be very protective of the island so if anyone comes close by she'll definitely Mimi, no, crocodiles don't fight with the hippos, although sometimes a very big crocodile, if he has a chance, might try to attack a little baby hippo, but that means he has to get past the big mummy hippo that I would not want to, to, to make her angry. The female hippos or the mummy hippos are very protective over their babies. So, no, they, they don't really compete for the same food. They share the same watering holes and kind of not in competition for anything. So they don't have any reason to kind of fight with each other. They kind of stay away from each other. But as I said, hippo crocodiles are opportunistic. So if they did have a chance and the mother hippo wasn't looking after her little one, they would definitely try their luck and take a chance to try and get that little baby hippo but definitely have to try and get past that mother hippo is going to be very difficult Out in the wild, life moves fast. To capture the action, you've got to be in the right spot at the wrong time. Now, incredible animal behavior, selected from amazing amateur and professional footage to reveal the secret lives of animals in motion. This is raw nature caught in the act. There was, uh, apparently there was elephants on the dam cam. I was actually making my way that side now. But let's still go there. We might be lucky. Maybe there might be more that's going to come around that side. So I'm not too far. Not too far. Let's quickly see if we can get some elephants for the afternoon. 
some elephants. Double checking. Oh. So it's a, it's a beautiful dam where Kerry is. Uh, Chitwa Dam, stunning, stunning dam. Such a big, that's like the, the largest water body in the northern Sabi Sands where Kerry is. So it houses at least so many hippos there. There's some crocodiles. Always a nice area to be at. That looks like cool. Ooh. Ooh. So a little fork-tailed drongo bird just decided to fly almost into us here. Sorry, my comms is soft and then it goes loud, then it's soft and then it's loud. All right, so I just adjusted here quickly. Let's get to the dam. Let's hopefully those elephants to hang around. Let's hopefully they hang around. On a day like this, always, you're gonna find elephants going to the dam, they will swim. They will swim. On a hot day like this, it'll be a pool party. Elephant pool party. I want to see it. And I want to see it. When are those elephants still there? Any updates on those elephants for me, please? I just have to tell, ask my director just to give me an update. That's fine, that's fine. As long as they're still at the dam, that's fine. I'll try and get there and try and get those elephants. It's not too far, it's just over the ridge and we should be there. And it's always nice. Luckily, I know the property very well, like the back of my hand, so I'll know exactly the quickest, the shortest, the easiest route to the dam. Well, I hope so. <laughs> Eden 12 years old is there's always danger here. You must remember <clears throat> it's wild animals. Wild animals is wild animals. So no matter what, uh, you always have to be very observant. You've got to be very wary of your surroundings. <clears throat> you gotta, you gotta take notice of stuff. Don't just get out. You'll find many of the guides, even the cam ups as well, they know very well themselves. To when they're getting off the vehicle, first scan the area around just to double check that there's nothing dangerous around them, and then you can get out. But uh, rather have somebody that's a professional, you know, like a professional guide in that to be around because. Uh, Pretty much that is what we were taught and uh, yeah, it's, it's like second nature for me now. So if I get out the vehicle to try and track lions or leopards and all that, that's fine. You know, it's, it's, I know what I'm doing. So I've had my fair share of lions charging me, I'm walking into leopards. Sorry, impalas. We are just going to come past you. If you don't mind. So many impalas here. All of them. Hello. 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 Yes. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. All right. So <laughs> I'm just I did the the. Elephants are just down here, so we're just going to try and get to the elephants.
Okay, we've got a nice viewpoint here. So we can at least see where those elephants have gone. If they were swimming, I think they might have gone out that way. All right, thanks, Gwen. So she said the elephants went from the dam. They went opposite side there into the bushes. That's fine. We'll find them. We'll get some elephants there. That was my anyway. My plan of action for this afternoon is to go to the north a bit as well and wait for any up updates for anybody coming from the east to see if uh, maybe that male leopard will come across. I think there might be that side there somewhere, Cam. Across the dam wall we go, across the dam wall we go. All right, we are gonna go, I think left, I can. I think left, yeah, I'm gonna take left. So it's either left or right, so we decided to go left. I think it might be the right decision. <laughs> yeah, the right decision to go left. Some guinea fowl. Little, little, little guinea fowl coming across. I saw some young ones there. Look at these little chicks. Little ones. Oh, look at that. Little, little ones. Helmeted guinea fowl. Well, not very small anymore. And I kind of, you know, say some. Hmm. Standing by. Of course, Cedric. Afternoon. Anything happening outside? Nothing. Uh, nothing at the moment. Uh, um, sorry. Yeah. Nothing. I'm um, just live. I'll give you a shout just now. Come here. Malika, you're most welcome. It was fantastic. Fantastic uh, having all the kids on uh, the kids drive this afternoon. Do appreciate it. And there's some flies that's flying and sticking to my face. But yes, it was wonderful. Always nice to learn about all different things during the drive. But I think I'm just going to sit here and just say thank you. And uh, yes, thank you so much for all the nice comments and all the questions that everybody sent through to us on the kids show. It's always nice just to try and answer as many as uh, possible. And it was always fun. It's always a lot of fun. We have to have fun in the bush. That's one thing. You must never be too serious in the bush. Always have fun and look for some fun things to do. I think uh, that's uh, nature always gives us uh, those options. So, yes. All right. Well, we're going to... Oh, what is that on top there? On the dead, dead branch. It looks like another dead branch. <laughs> it's a dead branch on a dead branch. But yeah, from the Wild Earth Crew... Thank you so much, and uh, yes, we will see you same place, same time tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back if you're just joining us on our safari this afternoon. We have managed to find ourselves some young elephant bulls and this light is just beautiful on them. Look how it's kind of hitting them really lovely. The grass. Oh, they've 
they've been going back and forth between these two marilla trees <laughs> a bit of competition there anyway good afternoon hello again if you're only joining us my name's kerry and behind me on the camera we have panda yeah of course we're on wendy this afternoon just enjoying watching these elephants they've been back and forth between these two marilla trees while we've been watching them for the last few minutes scouring the ground for any marillas there was a third bull with them young bull he took off behind us just crossed over on the other side of the road he was enough with these two they were giving him a bit of a hard time yep. there's a nice breeze you can see the grass moving in the wind Ah, oh, that's nice. Isn't that nice, Panda? It's cooling down the afternoon. It's been nice warm. I must say I really did love this morning. It's nice and cool. So, Hannah, elephants are also browsers. So they, at the moment, they're eating these marilla fruits from that marilla tree, that big tree that was just on the left. Oop, off he goes. But elephants, at the moment, they're also feeding on a lot of grass. So there's a lot of grass around here at the moment that they're feeding on. They'll also actually feed on the branches of this marilla tree. So they'll also feed on a lot of branches of trees and sticks. They do like acacia trees as well. Of course, any fruit species they can get that they enjoy they'll also feed on those too i know some other elephants will also feed on the pods of the anna tree or the fade herbia albida during the dry season they'll walk under these trees and pick the pods so they have quite a varied diet anna um, yeah they do feed on a lot of different things um yeah i'm just really enjoying the scenery right now isn't that beautiful look at how this grass is almost glowing there all right, well, let's make our way and see what else we can find in this open area we're about to go in. I can already see some impala down there, so let's see what else we've got waiting for us. As elephants have taken off, they've just probably gone around the corner to the next marula tree. So, we'll see what we can find along the way. Yep. gonna go off a little bit here panda let's see is there anything here Ooh, what's happening there jelly bee wild dog and aardvark wow that's a that's a tough quest what have we got there is that a wildebeest oh and some zebra we got some zebra and wildebeest look at this over here isn't that cool okay okay we'll just stay calm stay calm don't want to frighten the wildlife away now all right so we're just going to go on the other side of this airstrip so we're just on an airstrip here and we don't want to frighten <gasps> super excited about our zebra it's my favorite animal Cedric was making fun of me the other day with my zebra so I'm super happy to find my zebra and he's gonna Cedric's gonna carry on looking for his his uh, his leopard but I'm happy to find some zebra so let's do the wildebeest while we're here we'll just get this male wildebeest and enjoy him this is a blue wildebeest male on his own see he's hanging out with the impala it could be it's also known as a symbiotic relationship so he's hanging out with them for protection the more eyes and the more ears all the better to see you with and all the better to hear you with if you're an antelope species you definitely has more protection in numbers so that could be why this beautiful male wildebeest is or handsome so rather say handsome male wildebeest is hanging out with these impala if you have a look there look at his shabby mane he's got quite a nice shabby long mane see it kind of hanging on his neck there really beautiful long mane he's got see every now and then you might see his skin shudder a little bit if there's any insects oh there we go some insects on him that's how he chases the insects away he's also got like a nice 
It's got a lot of fluff underneath his throat there. It almost looks like a billy goat with a long beard. Look at that long fluff under his throat. So the purpose of a mane on a wildebeest, well of course, besides making him look very handsome, would probably be to help him chase away flies and insects. I'd probably say that'd probably be a good purpose, but I think it looks makes him look rather, rather, rather handsome, don't you? Look at that little, <laughs> he's almost got like a beard or like a billy goat kind of, billy goat's gruff kind of beard under his chin there. He's pretty, isn't he? So I also call my hair my, my mane because it's also very wild and kind of shabby some days. Definitely gets all over the place. Um, but this wildebeest has a very tidy mane. I need to find out what his treatment plan is. What has he got going on there? How does he keep his mane so nice and well kept? Whoop, look at him there. See his tail, he's flicking away all the insects. A lot of flies out today, probably. So, we've got a wildlife Super Bowl that will be starting from the 9th to the 11th of February. And uh, the Super Bowl uh, will basically, if you join us on Safari, we'll have all of our naturalists on every location will be competing to see who can spot the most species over these three days. And uh, yeah, so it'll be a lot of fun from the 9th of February to the 11th of February. We're all gonna have a competition and see who can spot the most animals, the most species on these drives on the sunset safaris. All right, let's go check out our zebra. I'm really excited to see the zebra. We saw three zebra the other day, which was really cool. I was very, very excited to see my, my first zebra here on Juma. I've been seeing the tracks, I will admit. I've seen the tracks quite a few times, but I've just keep missing them every time. So it's nice to see a nice big harem of zebra. Looks like there's four of them here. Let's see what's happening. Hello guys. They're in the shade there, just grazing. Puma, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm excited to be exploring Chitwa as well. I know the signal hasn't been too great over here, so I don't know where all the best signal spots are, so yep, let's have a look at these zebra. I'm going to get my binoculars out and I want to have a very good look at these zebra here. Let's see, oof, they are nice and stocky. Oop, shame, one of them, second one on the right, doesn't have his full tail. Oop. Uh, this wildebeest just gave an alarm call and he's kind of alerted everything. So yeah, this zebra that's got a semi-missing tail could be from a fight. There's another zebra. Just trying to have a look, see, and that looks like, if I'm not mistaken, um, the one without the tail could be our stallion. So if you see the difference with the males and females, the stallions are a lot more stocky. Definitely see their necks are very thick and their necks very stocky and the females also have a bigger stripe on their behind side so between their legs at the back the females will have a bigger stripe there and obviously with the males if you look close enough there's a gap from behind or from the side you can also see the males testes so there's testicles you can sometimes see in between his legs one on the left hand side has got beautiful colorations. She's almost got like, I love how you get the black and white, but then you get some individuals that almost have a little brown stripe in between. So you can see the other one on the far left, she's almost got black and white with a brown stripe as well. Oh, um, stallion has also got 
a red bull ox picker. There's one in there. Just gonna quietly watch and enjoy this afternoon with these zebra and the afternoon sounds. It's World Hippo Day. Wilder is celebrating one of the world's most fearsome and powerful animals with a hippo appreciation fireside chat. From terrifying teeth to territorial behavior, join James and Steve as we pay homage to the third largest mammal on earth. Don't wallow in the mud, be hipper than a hippo and join the pod. Watch it live on our app. Wild Earth, connecting with nature. Just enjoying watching the zebra here so I just want to thank all of our viewers for your very kind donations so I'm just going to go through the list of some of our viewers that I want to thank that we want to thank from the Wild Earth team Nick Coston Link, Lisa Kilvitz, Alet Kruger, Debra Hiesel, Robin A. Eckern, Sheila Wright, Bruce Halmanbold, David Legalt, Kathy Sutter, and Timothy Cousins. Just want to say a very big thank you from the Wild Earth team for your very kind donations. They are very much appreciated. Just want to say a big thank you. So we're talking about zebras and females and males and the differences. So you can see this one closest to us. She's probably a little bit pregnant and you can see her back. So see how the male's back is very flat? The female's back is kind of arched there. See how she's forming a bit of a belly. Unfortunately, folks, we are going to have to start making our way shortly. Really enjoying watching these zebras, but we do have to make our way. So, I'm gonna start up here. I am super happy. Big smiles on my face. Got our zebra. Nice one, Panda. 
Well done. We got your elephant, so what else do we get? What else did we get? Got a nice wildebeest, a parlor. It's a lot happening here. Got some water buck earlier. So I've got two, three water buck. Little baby, very cute, running in the water. We've got a crocodile. Wow, it's all happening. Lots happening this afternoon. We were hoping that there might be some sort of predator activity here this afternoon. It seems a little bit quiet, but I think we've got a lot of antelope species, which is really cool. Not sure if this male wildebeest is, is George from, from the other side of the tracks, from Juma. I think it's a little bit far away, so probably another male. Anyway, while we're searching this side, let's head over to Cedric and see what he's got at Biffle's Hook Dam. Good luck, Cedric. All the best. Yeah, look at little goz little goslings are going to that little what is that? It's a stilt? I can't see. Looks like a stilt to me. Am I right or am I wrong here? Sorry, it's uh, uh, my and the little three little goslings. Mm. Quite a few species, yeah. Yeah, it's a, a three banded plover, the blacksmith, lapwing, Egyptian geese and that other one on the left. <laughs> that other one. the other one on the left. I don't know what it is. Am I? Oh, you know, and the thing is my, my binox is so blurred at the moment. My my focus knobby thing on the on the binox has decided to stick the other day and doesn't want to focus. I just see blur like a blurred white thing on that side. I'm going to use rather the screen. Yeah, I think that's... It must be, I've got it. It doesn't, uh, it's not a black wing stilt. Oh. The uh, sandpiper, oh, okay. But a little bit big, but you might be you know, like a common sandpiper. Picky, you might be actually right on that. I was just sort of looking maybe towards because the black wings still got a beautiful orange legs and the beautiful black wings. I thought it might have been like maybe a juvenile, but uh, I think it's just a bit short for a, a still so a common sandpiper. Thank you, Picky. That is nice. That is very nice. We don't really get to see them that often. Yeah, we usually get the wood sandpiper. Saw the wood sandpiper that down there at the, another dam called Twin Dams on the southern side of Juma uh, last year. We got to see the wood sandpiper there, smaller than the common sandpiper, and uh, busy catching little insects, there, little water arthropods around that side. At least you can still see. On the far right hand side got the typical three banded plover, very small as well. Catherine, yeah, nice little bird party going down this side. Oh, the three banded plover as well, beautiful little ones that runs along the little banks here, yeah, so catching all the little insects. Very, very cute. So they, they did not change their names to the lapwings like the other, like the blacksmith uh, lapwing that you will see that's coming into frame. Now, that's, they were used to also be known as a plovers, but then they realized that to reclassify them into the correct species, or it could not actually species, but correct family, and was uh, into the lapwing family. <coughs> Julian and James, you say it looks like a green shank. Do, do, do. Uh, yo, I don't think when last have I seen a shank in a common green shank here. Yeah. Nah, uh, there. Oh. This is what I love about Wild Earth. We all get together, you know, from all corners of the world and we all put our heads together to see what have we got here. I love it. So we've got now, so far, oh no, I think it looks like a common sandpiper to me, as soon as it ran off there. See the green, the green, uh, the common green shank 
has got much darker feathers. So the common green, and plus right on top of the head and the breast area, is much blacker. It's got, uh, it's more of a black colour. Well, this is uh, more of a brownish uh, colour, typical with uh, the common uh, sandpiper. I'm going to go with the common sa uh, sandpiper. But thank you anyway for everyone. That's fantastic. It's always nice to really get through this. I just want to double check them. The sandpiper. Let me get my bird up here. Let's look here quickly as well. Hmm. Very far. Yeah, it's very far. It's so difficult to really get that okay well uh, yeah let's we say we, <laughs> it could be either one of them i'm not gonna either judge that it's well it's a different species yeah i know so, i mean if it's a even if it's a sandpiper or uh, a green shank it's either way what a what a nice uh, find here at bifflesuk dam very nice So they say that the green shanks hangs around, migrates to the coastal areas and freshwater wetlands. All right. It's gone that side. Is it going into the... Oh, that, that's a... That's a, well, I think it's a pie piking piece. fisher, yeah. On safari. Now remember, this is live and interactive, so we'd love to hear from you. To be having these incredible experiences in this wild underwater forest. It, it was just one of those things which I don't think I'll ever see again in my life. Thanks for joining us on our sunrise safari.
But just talking about uh, nature and everything, um, well, if you want to join us on our mission, Wild Earth's mission, to really showcase and you know, just uh, show these beautiful African animals to the rest of the world, and uh, you want to make uh, you know make things work for us as well, please uh, go onto our website that is wildearth.tv and just go onto the donate button just to get some more information on it. But on top of that, I just want to say thank you to these individuals for their donations. Maria Rossiniti, Jill Sharwood, Renan de Villiers, Carol Elaine Trethaway, John Carpenter, Anton Louis, Marianne Maynard, Gina Deacon, Carolyn Allen, and Philip Chadwin. Thank you so much, Donkey. And Como Suneni for your donations. So we've just come back onto Juma now. We had our first little exploration to Chitwa. It was really cool. We got some zebra, some wildebeest, impala, some nice elephants. And the sun was really hitting that grass really nicely. I will admit it was like all like glowing almost. So we're just kind of back on the boundary, eastern boundary of Juma now. We're just having a look. Maybe if you pick out on any tracks, we found and saw another game viewer. They didn't have much of an update for us. We heard some Dwarf mongies calling on the side of the road. They always so. Okay, copy and shout if you need a hand. Cool, just checking in with Cedric and letting him know we're here to help if he needs. We're back, back in action. Sorry, they got something on the lens there. So Panda's just gonna give the lens a quick wipe. Could be from all the dust, a lot of dust at the moment. Can you see me? It's squeaky clean. Hey, hello. <laughs> all right, looks like we're clean, ready to go. Now these little dwarf monkeys on the side of the road, they have a very high pitched little sound. Crystal, crystal, yes, safari time. Let's see what we can find. We're just having a good scout. Had yeah, a little chirping sound of the little dwarf mongies, but unfortunately they were in the thick grass. Really difficult to find them. But every now and then you hear that sound, you're like, oh, what's that? What's that? Very like squeaky, like a squeaky toy noise, like you're squishing a squeaky toy. Cedric is also following up some tracks on a very similar boundary as well. I'm trying to see. Uh. We're also just trying to see if we've got any visitors crossing the boundary this afternoon coming in to visit. Seems to be a popular place, some of these boundaries for animals to cross into the reserve. The sun is just at a sharp angle there. Ah, what a lovely afternoon. Sun is hitting the. Oh, we've got some mouse birds on the left there. It looks like red faced mouse birds. Just gonna reverse the. Uh, okay, we might be able to get them. There's a. Just flown. They're in a little flock. They've flown onto a bush just behind there. Let's see if I can get a better angle. Yep. No, I don't. Oh. I'll give it a try. See. Just behind there. Uh. Can you see them? Oh, look like red-faced mouse birds. Oop, there we go. Hello. Love the noise of these mouse birds. And when you see them on the road, you do see why they're called mouse birds. These long tails, and they've got a mousy grayish color. When you see them on the road, they really sometimes do look like little mice. You can see the sun shining nicely on its face when it turns its head there. Look. that long tail. They love to feed on little fruit. The perfect season for them. 
love their little chirping noise that they make when they kind of all fly off together. Gabello. My favorite aquatic bird. Hmm, that's quite a tricky one because I have a few. I know you were talking about the, uh, what is it, uh, pygmy geese. Is it yesterday? I have seen pygmy geese and they are adorable. They are very, very cute. Like, almost look like a cute little squeaky toy you'd have in your bath if you have a little kid and have a little cute squeak, squeaky toy in there. And they're always in pairs. Sometimes you might get them in little flocks of up to four. I've seen those before. They're really cute. But of course, another one which is always very cool to see is the African finfoot. It's a very rare aquatic bird species that you can find. It's jet black in color. I've seen some variations that also have like a bit of green, greenish blue tinge to the wings. Um, and of course my favorite part of the finfoot is they've got these funny duck-like orange feet and bill. Pretty cool little bird, the African finfoot. So I'm trying to see if these little mouse birds will fly off together and you can hear them calling. Let's see if they'll fly off at all. What are they up to? Just sitting there, of course. We get the speckled mouse bird and the red faced mouse bird. Oh, Catherine, is that right? The new bird on your list? That makes me excited. The red faced mouse bird. Oh, well done, Catherine. It's always lovely when you. So we call them a lifer. So, bird is called a new bird. When you get a new bird to tick off your list, it's called a lifer. So, you'd say in South Africa, or a lifer bird. It's a new bird species. You can, and uh, yeah, I know some some crazy bird is that. Sure, whenever they get a new lifer, they are absolutely ecstatic, bouncing all over the place. Just waiting for them to move. Come on, so you can hear them call. They're not moving. They know we're talking about them. Yeah, I must say I also get pretty excited. So I have my I need to catch up on my Juma eBirds list. So I'll, I'll get up to that on my next leave when I have some chance. Catch up on the birds. I've definitely got a few new birds for Juma to add to my list here. Um, I'm trying to think if I have any new. Oh, yeah, that greater honey guide. That'll be a new lifer for me that we saw the other day. I haven't actually seen one properly, like a good sighting, so that'll be pretty cool. Uh, I think the great spotted cuckoo. That was also a lifer for me. Whoop, off they go. There's still one left there. I don't think they're going to call. So, Panda, I have a picture here in my book. This African finfoot. You see number five here. Just tell me if you can see that clearly. There we go. Last one at the bottom of the page here. Number five. This is the African finfoot. Isn't it strange looking little bird? See the orange feet over there and it's got a bit of black on the top of its bill as well as orange at the bottom of its bill. So you can see the juveniles more mottledy brown in color with a bit of white and the adults they get this black coloration. And obviously they're in densely vegetated rivers and streams and very difficult to see. They're very elusive birds. So it's actually an, kind of like an intermediate between a cormorant and a duck. They do move quite slowly in the water, I must admit. It does, at first, when you first look at it, it does look like it could be a darter, but you see that shocking yellow or orange and you kind of think, mm, what is that? So... Yeah, like I said, I've seen some individuals in West Africa, you get a very, we thought again it might be a, a kind of a bit of a hybrid, but on its back wings there, it was a beautiful purple, like purpley green, bluish color on its back of its wings there. So very pretty pictures, managed to get of them. And of course, it's a very special bird to see. So 
yeah, not a lot of people get to see these birds. The Zambezi River, I know you can uh, see the finfoot sometimes on the boat cruises, although everyone always says those that, but I've never seen one on the Zambezi River actually. Maybe I was too young and I wasn't into birding yet, but uh, yeah, my only finfoot sightings that I can actually recall have been in the Brazzaville, Congo, in Odzala National Park. All right. Nice bit of birding there. Anyways, let's head on, see what else is waiting for us in golden hour. Golden hour is upon us. Look at this beautiful light. So I'd love to know our viewers. So what is your favorite aquatic bird species? I'd love to know. Flamingos. I've taken a liking to flamingos the last few years. I've seen flamingos documentaries and oh, they're beautiful. They're, how the color of their kind of feathers changes depending on what they feed on. So when they come from more coastal regions that will have more shellfish that they feed on, they go this bright pink color and they actually get that color from the food that they feed on as opposed to when they have, spend more time in inland areas where there's not as much um, kind of uh, when their diet obviously changes and then they go a much lighter color. So are very cool flamingos. Love how they have that feeding habit. They have their kind of head in the water and kind of yeah like feed. They're very interesting feeding color. I know they do feed on algae as well which is quite quite unique and interesting. So I'd love to know from our viewers what your favorite waterfowl species is. Catherine, if you're still watching, I'm sure you've got a few pretty cool uh, waterfowl on your bird list. Please let us know what your favorite waterfowl species is. Mm -mm 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 -mm. What's your favorite waterfowl panda? Um, well, Jakana, yeah, that's a waterfowl. African jacana. Those feet are incredible, aren't they? The the lily. Their feet are very long. They've got very long toes, and that enables them to actually walk on the lilies. So another nickname for them is a lily trotter. Got some impala here. Hello, guys. Whoop! Sorry. Oh, look, the light is hitting them really nicely there. Bob Vacation, a swan. Yes, swans are beautiful. Uh, I can't remember, I've only seen, oh, we don't get too many swans around here. I've only seen swans in kind of maybe zoos or parks of some sort. But I know that the mute swan would have won the largest flying bird in the world but because it molts for three months or two months of the year i can't quite recall i think it's two months of the year that's actually it molts it cannot fly for that time so there's like two to three months of the year that it can't fly and that's what disqualified it from the uh, bird kind of flight competition Oh, the Canadian goose. Got some nice impala there. I have seen those Canadian goose. If I'm not if I'm not mistaken, they also congregate in big flocks as well in Canada. I'm thinking of the right goose. I think it's got a bit of grey to it. They're also quite pretty, I must admit. I think I've seen them as well on a documentary here or there. Beautiful those Canadian geese. Shayus, a something soft build pelican, is that right? Yes. Oh, pelicans. Yeah, no, I do love pelicans. It's, it's kind of weird when you see pelicans uh, when they in their migratory kind of when you catch them when they're halfway through their migratory path somewhere. So, rock candy, Susie. Yes, we have another flamingo lover out there. Um, 
Susie, if you love flamingos, I think I just watched recently on, must have been Disney Plus, there's a very good documentary on flamingos. Oh, yes, thank you, Catherine. Flamingos, are they pretty, eh? Yeah, so, ah, there we go, Catherine. We seem to be getting a lot of flamingo lovers. I think it's just because they're big pink birds. Who doesn't love a big pink bird with a bright pink bill? Hello. It's Yeah, if you have a look on Disney Plus, um, it's a very good documentary that just came out about flamingos. I was trying to get through it. I wasn't paying 100% attention to it, but I was enjoying having the flamingos in the background. I do find it really interesting I, uh, when you do get a documentary. I think in that documentary there was a kill with the African fish eagles actually taking down a flamingo, which, oh, that is hectic. Isn't that crazy if you think of an African fish eagle hunting flamingos but this is in again like the salt pan somewhere please correct me if i'm wrong uh, again i said like i said i was not paying 100 percent attention to this documentary just when i saw the kill i was like oh what's happening there i think it was a salt pan somewhere and if i'm not mistaken flamingos they can actually live in this water walk in water that would not be able to sustain any any other life i think it's because of the algae that they need to feed on and um yeah they, they had a african fish eagle that came in and he kind of like herds the flamingos Wild Earth Travel, in association with Wandering Through, is offering some exclusive privately guided safaris in 2024. James is taking a trip into the famed woodlands of the mysterious White Lion, Ngala Private Game Reserve, in July. Steve and Cedric will lead a safari to Chitwa Chitwa in November. To book, email travel at wildearth.tv or go to the website for more information. We are looking forward to seeing you on safari. Right, so coming back to the southwestern corner, as you know, I'm still trying to follow up on on that male leopard, old tortoise pan, hoping that he's coming he's coming north. Um, yeah, it'll be nice <clears throat> if he did come this side now. So I'm just going to look exactly at certain places where he likes crossing from the south to the north. But I'm just thinking to myself now, there might be one or two 
reasons that he might have not come this side as of yet. Maybe he made a kill inside Hoffman's a possibility, you know. And I'm hoping that's not the, the case. Well, I, might, oh, well look, I don't mind if he has something to eat. Of course, he needs to eat, but so he can make a kill here inside uh, Juma, and then I'll say fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting a bit picky here. All right, so this is exactly where he crosses in most of the times. Most times, it'll come over the road. Yeah, I don't know how a signal will be here, so I'm just going to go very slowly here. I'm hoping that Rusty stays good with signal here, please. Feels like it feels good so far. So far, so good. I'm going to see Gwenny's going to tell me now to go stationary, I'm sure. Alright. Mm. Oh, doesn't look anything yeah. Oh, it's on green. Alright. Alright, thank you. Wonderful. <clears throat> Alright, let's see this side. Nothing yeah, so you either yeah or sometimes you'll go it's a little game path here as well. I will cut across. So we'll just have to take a look on this road very carefully. If it doesn't come a so somewhere in this area he likes crossing. And we don't want to miss it. Don't want to miss a single single track. If you miss one track, you could be put off completely. Alright, let's go slowly along here. Yeah? Snail pace. And he won't walk along here. Usually, will come out from the south, from the left. He'll come onto the road, and he'll go straight. As I say, he'll be tracks going directly across and not down the road. Mm, I'm going to celebrate. Going to find this male leopard. Celebrate with another cup of tea. What is that on the? What is that? Sorry, there's a funny black thing that's stuck to the side here. Uh, I saw the other. It looked like a heather. Tristan, I also wonder how many leopards we pass. I think we pass many leopards on a daily basis. What is this? Well, mustn't. It almost looks like it's got tar on it. Almost. Uh, oh. It hasn't got any smell, but it looks like it's ants. Maybe a certain species of ant that's creating this. But interesting that it's got this liquid, almost like tar, that is caked on the outskirts of. It looks like mud on the inside. It looks like mud. That is very interesting. Well, if you do know anything about this please let me know you can even see it dripping it's so much of it that it drips onto the leaves like the, the gum i'm sure it's gum or something that actually is secreted maybe through the ants or whatever it builds us i'm just looking here wow i've never seen this before yeah it's definitely mud it must be one of the ant species that's made this and then they covered this to protect. It doesn't have a smell to it. Hmm. And it looks quite heavy. You can see it's even weighing down the branch itself. So but I don't want to go and bother that at all. That is nice. Very interesting. A little casing there for the ants. Looks like it looked like an ever, eh? Hey? <laughs> A wild ever of the Sobby Sands. Anyway, let's head over to Kerry.
good luck with your tortoise pan search, Cedric. We uh, we didn't find any fresh leopard tracks on um, crossing in, but still keeping it. I know we had a lot of people asking about the the Wiggs family of owls, so we're also keeping a lookout for those in the area we're in today and this morning. Haven't seen them for a while though, but that's probably a good thing. That means that probably their chick has fledged and they've maybe gone off to a another place for now I wonder I'm talking about um, Cedric I think Cedric found some sappy looking weird stuff from a tree so we're talking about bush babies and how bush babies love to feed on the the sap of acacia trees so I mean what sap is it's kind of like this resin kind of sticky substance that comes out the tree I'm not sure if the bush bush babies or oh, sorry galagos little galagos were actually feed on the it when it's soft but I know also when it crystallizes they can also feed on that hard crystallized sap and of course this is does make up a lot of the little galagos diet little night apes and uh, that's what they'll feed on and it's pretty cool this stuff so I'm not a tree here in southern Africa that'll do, th do this, but when I was working in Odzala National Park, there was one tree that they called the candle of the forest, and the sap that came from this tree, so it actually, again, when the tree has an injury, it's like a, you know, if you get a blister and you get that liquid in your blister, so it's the same for the tree, maybe there's an injury and it excretes this bit of a sappy substance that helps to protect the tree or helps prevent it from getting further injuries, maybe if there's a boring insect of some sort, and this candle of the forest sap so what would happen is you'd, it would sometimes fall big form like bigger uh, balls on the side of the tree that'll fall off or long kind of looks like a little icicle kind of thing and you can actually take that and light it and it will just burn so once you've actually lit this little piece of wax uh, well piece of sorry sap hardened sap it'll actually continue burning so of course in the forest it's very difficult to make a fire there's very little materials to start a fire with and everything is always wet of course tropical rainforest that's how it goes right but if you use this candle of the forest uh, sap from a tree um, it's actually pretty cool because then you can put it there and it will just burn and burn and burn until um, you've managed to get something else lit. Uh, I know it's used in, in Congo in some of their churches because it has a very nice smell. Almost like eucalyptus leaves. If you burn eucalyptus leaves it gives off a lovely smell. So I do actually, I think I have a piece that I found one day in the forest. So when I come back next time I'll, I'll bring this little candle of the forest with me and I'll light it for you and show you you can leave it there and it'll just burn away it does have a very lovely aroma or essence it's quite nice smelling oh we've got some nice clouds building up there I haven't seen any yeah I'll definitely bring it next time I come back from my next leave and show you how it works so it's a great way to start a fire in the forest. So another way of course if you're trying to start a fire in the forest and you, it's impossible to find anything dry is they have this moss which is called elephant's hair moss or horse's hair moss that hangs from the trees. A lot of birds will actually use that moss and it literally does look like elephant's hair literally just hanging from the tree and somehow I don't know but it seems to be very very dry all the time so if you can find some of that I know the sunbirds like to make their nests with that can find a little piece of that hanging on the tree you can put that on top of your candle of the forest try and find some semi dry little pieces of sticks and twigs and you can eventually get a fire going like that but otherwise if you don't have one of those it's gonna be a long time before you manage to get a fire going in the forest if you need to make cook food or anything like that now, I must say I'd much rather be stranded in the bush in southern Africa than in the forest in central Africa Central West Africa. We all know the struggle of finding the perfect gift. But what if you could give them an unforgettable experience? Something truly extraordinary. Introducing Nature Eye. 
Fly a real drone remotely at iconic locations, witnessing the beauty of nature like never before. Sign up to be an explorer and you could win one of these experiences yourself. Visit NatureEye.com today. just talking about earlier how if you're stranded out in the wilderness and you ever have to look after yourself um, making a fire is definitely one very important uh, kind of skill <laughs> you need to have and I would much rather be stranded in the bush in southern Africa somewhere than in the forests of Azala National Park or in Gabon or Central African Republic because I tell you those jungles there are not for the faint-hearted they are definitely a tropical paradise but yeah I really did enjoy the camp that we stayed in and having a nice dry bed and a hot shower at the end of the day same as when you're on safari here yeah, it's always lovely to go out on safari but it is nice to come back to some luxuries of your camp at the end of the day Isn't that just magical? Kerry, good luck if you do all of the fire making uh, stuff there. Well, it is quite a skill that, and uh, geez, I'd like to get a bit of a demonstration on that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that would be quite interesting. So she'll make a fantastic fire very quickly i think with me um uh, i think my fire skills is uh, out of 10 uh, maybe a and especially me i love I love survival stuff so you would think that my my fire skills should be right up Hail to thee, blithe spirit. 
bird thou never wert, that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Higher still and higher from the earth thou springest. Like a cloud of fire, the blue deep thou wingest. And singing still dost soar, and soaring ever singest. Sorry, we just lost Cedric momentarily there. I think he's in a little bit of a bad signal spot, but we just about to head off to Gowrie Dam to see what is happening at Gowrie Dam. The treehouse dam seems to be a little bit quiet, although this is quite a beautiful sunset here with all these beautiful dead skeleton trees, I must admit. All right, should we head over to Gowrie there? Yep. Let's go see what's happening at Gowrie Dam. Oop. Before well, Marula falls on your head. <laughs> Megan, this is definitely a stunning sunset, I agree. I pa didn't park in the best spot. Panda, you're pretty lucky that uh, you didn't get a Marula fall falling on your head there. I parked right under a Marula tree. That wasn't the most smart thing to do. <laughs> Whoops. Okay, let's get out from under this tree before we get some Marulas falling on our head. You. Was it with you, Panda, when we were with the elephant? Yeah, and the marula's falling right at the back there. Yeah, yeah so we had a <laughs> we had an elephant segment the other day, and we're watching some elephants, and we're parked again close to a marula tree. Luckily, these marulas were not falling; they were falling just kind of behind the car. But I was wondering, oh, I wonder when one's gonna fall on Panda's head. And actually, when we were watching Flalumba the other day, the female leopard. Um, she also had a few marulas that were pretty close to her, I, I will admit. Okay, anything happening? No, little indigo bird at the top of the tree there. <laughs> That's a strange smell. Yep. What's happening around? So yeah, talking about making fires and I think, yeah, I got taught when I was pretty young how to make a fire with, with sticks, but Alka, there we go. I knew they had to do something to do with the shellfish. So I, yeah, but I wasn't 100% sure. So that's where the flamingos actually get their pink coloration from. So obviously when they're inland and they're feeding on uh, freshwater shrimp that don't have any coloration to their kind of uh, outer shells, then the flamingos color changes as well. But when they come from coastal regions that have uh, sh uh, shrimp that are very pink, that pink coloration actually gets absorbed into the flamingo system and that's what makes the flamingos have that beautiful pink coloration on their wings. Isn't that crazy? Thank you so much for that, Alta. Um, that's pretty cool to know that what flamingos feed on and what you fed some flamingos. So we're talking about making fires and how you can make fires with two kind of sticks. So again, I was telling Panda, find there's a specific type of dry wood. Of course, you need to get a base. So a nice flat piece of dry wood about this long. And then you make a, a hole into the wood with a tiny slit down the side. And then you get the same piece of wood. Also, it must be very dry. And then, of course, you kind of have to take the piece of wood in your hand. And you have to kind of do this. So you'll be like kind of doing this rubbing your hands down the piece of wood but your hands that is very very rough on your hands and I would not do that midday because it's a very strenuous process you basically trying to the dry wood trying to get a bit of a spark off of that dry wood but it has to be very warm in order for the spark to be there an elephant dung 
you get some very or rabbit so you put elephant dung first and then you get some uh, hair the pellets of a hair and then you just kind of break that up right next to the crack that comes out of the side of the wood there and then of course you're hoping that a spark will come out from the little section that you are kind of rubbing the piece of wood in and the spark will hopefully go out into the little hair dung and then you have to very quickly start blowing it so that it catches a flame but and nowadays there are a lot more <laughs> advanced techniques you can use a rope you can use you almost make something like a bow and arrow to to help you with this kind of like friction process um, but the process I got taught was uh, yeah quite quite strenuous and I must say um, yeah hurt my hands a lot and if you do it midday you have to be careful your sweat doesn't fall anywhere near that wood because imagine you're trying to get these two pieces of wood to kind of ignite and get hot and your sweat drops into that little hole and that's yeah that, then you have to start all again and wait for the piece of wood to dry so it is quite a strenuous process I've seen a lot of better more advanced ways to do it so yeah <laughs> That's actually a good question Trish. So Tamboti is a very bad tree to use around here for fire. So Tamboti actually has in the bark it's got some it's yeah it's I don't know if it's a bit of a like a toxic toxin that's inside the bark of the Tamboti tree. So it's very bad for using to burn on fire. So I wouldn't use it to start a fire either because if you inhale that smoke it can make you quite sick and worse if you actually cook anything on that smoke and uh, the fire and if the smoke gets into that meat and you eat it you can get rather sick i've had a few volunteers that uh yeah unfortunately they we left them alone at night on the fire by the fire and they ran out of firewood so they just walked into the bush and collected some wood and threw it onto the fire um, luckily one of us did smell there was a bad smell coming from the fireplace and we managed to come and remove the tamburti from the fire but one of the boys obviously the boy who was trying to get the fire going again he inhaled a bit of smoke and yeah he didn't feel so well for a few days so yeah tamburti is a really a bad wood to burn but yeah when you're out here looking for wood and you're not too sure you definitely want to get wood that's first of all must be dry so old old wood is probably better from a tree that's either fallen down or been dead for a while a hard wood is also really good wood to burn because if you get soft wood then it burns very quickly and then you're gonna have to keep putting wood back on the fire Good afternoon and welcome to Wild Earth's Bush Hub here in the Western Kruger. My name is James Henry, Gerrit is on camera, and over the next 30 minutes we're going to look at the highlights that took place in the field over the last 24 hours. We'll have a look at yesterday afternoon's sunset safari, this morning's sunrise safari, with an eye to planning this afternoon's activities in the field. This is On Safari.
Well, it looks like we've lost most of the light there with a beautiful uh, sunset. Stunning, 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 stunning. So I'm still here on the southwestern corner, still trying my utmost best to see if we're going to get lucky with uh, a tortoise pan, but uh, no luck at the moment. Nothing's come over. But anyway, let's go up uh, Zoe's. Let's see. Maybe we're lucky with maybe Shadulu. Maybe that leopardess. Maybe Mawati. Maybe Tlalum. Let's go. Last minute leopard. I can see it happening tonight. Problem is I didn't get any information about tortoise pan from the from the east, so I'm not too sure if anybody I don't know if anybody's followed up on him or I don't know exactly direction, if he's moved, if he's still there, if he's got a kill. If he decided to turn south again because of another male leopard calling or female calling, there's so many factors to it. Thank you, Mark. Yes, so I'm also hoping for that last minute leopard, which would be fantastic. I will be very, very happy. So let's see, let's see if we get that last minute leopard. Um, lions were also in the Hofmans, you must remember that, and Kuhuma Pride, they were in Hofmans. So hoping that uh, that Pride of Lions and Kuhuma Pride decides to come north tonight. If they do, they're going to come straight into uh, into Juma from Hofmans, a property that's just south of us. So there's a lot of potential for tomorrow morning. Lots, loads and loads of potential. So I think starting here tomorrow on Zoe's to the southwestern corner is going to be very important to our safari in the morning. Very important. And I think because it's going to be Wednesday, it is wild Wednesday tomorrow, and there's going to be a lot of wild sightings. So yes there's something to look forward to well there's always something to look forward to anyway no matter what always what <laughs> wild whisker wednesday that's it gwen wild whisker wednesday Lots of whiskers tomorrow morning. Lots and lots of whiskers. Forgotten how a female lion looks like. I'll just actually go look up uh, some photos and see how they, they look like. <laughs> we haven't seen one for such a long time. I don't know when last I've seen a female lion. Oof. Two weeks, three weeks ago. My longest year stint when I was working at one of the lodges without seeing lions is six weeks. I had like the normal six week uh, cycle, six weeks. And that was not just me, that was practically everybody that traversed on those certain areas. Well, there was just no lions for six weeks. So you can imagine when there was lion spurs on the property, every Tom, Dick and Harry <coughs> went to go and follow up on uh, those spurs but coming back to uh, a sad result with them of course going over into other properties. So 25th of January last time we saw it, alright, now we saw it Gwen, now that's the thing, it, it wasn't me. Could have been me. Oh yes, we found them on Biffles or Cutline. That's correct, when they got chased by the elephant. Yes, yes. 
That's right, we got chased by the elephant. That's correct. Oh, 25th of Jan, that's the last time we saw a female a lion. All right. Apparently the Talamati breakaways came back, then they went all the way to the west, ended up there in the western sector towards Dulini, Inyati, those areas. And then uh, apparently they made their way back to the side again, I think it was yesterday or the day before. They came all the way back to Baobab Dam. Not that we saw them, but I just heard. Yeah, shame. I really want to see that pride again. They're still struggling so much. Case 40, no, the case 40, that uh, injured male lion, the black tail male, he went straight south. He got his tracks there. He went straight into Hoffman's as well. So he ended up somewhere in the property that's also south of uh, Juma. <laughs> so yeah, that's where he ended up. Cheeky baby Ellie, uh, cat, cat, cat luck. Uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'm going to save my cat luck for tomorrow morning. I think I'll need to do that. Now it'll be just luck. Now we'll, be, now we'll use Cam's luck. How about that? Cam's cat luck. It was <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So Cam, in his first three weeks, yeah, I think, actually even four weeks, he had, yeah, I think it was riddled with uh, with leopard sightings everywhere, every corner. And now all of a sudden it's uh, been a bit of a dry spell for Cam and all that. So he says now, it's, I think he's pretty much run out of his cat luck. It's done. He, moon dust. Your moon dust is over. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, hopefully, 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 Panda's got some new new cat luck with him, and new moon dust that he brought with him. <laughs> yeah, that's how it goes in the bush. That's what's fantastic about it. You, we can we can't always. I can say find these uh, these cats. Dogman lover, yeah, that would be that would be amazing if uh, if Marip says to come out of uh, the bush in front of us now, just for some or other reason. So yeah, I'm not too sure which male leopard they saw this morning. Well, standing by. Sorry, I just want to quickly talk to. Sorry, nothing. Uh, sorry, nothing. I'm just live at the moment, but sorry, nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just letting the other guide know that we had nothing. So no cats aside, I was actually hoping for him to say, "Listen, any Juma uh, stations available? Uh, we've got uh, Tortoise Pan. It's just busy crossing Gauri Main into Juma. Uh, I'll like, well, we've got 10 minutes. I will fly there." Yeah, let's always wait for that, that little moment. But yeah, I'm talking about that male leopard there on the southern side of Chipto Airstrip. So I'm not even sure if it is uh, Marips because uh, the gentleman that gave us the update about uh, the leopard, um, he barely knew where Chipto Airstrip was. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to count that as uh, being Marips. We all know the struggle of finding the perfect gift. But what if you could give them an unforgettable experience? Something truly extraordinary. Introducing Nature Eye. Fly a real drone remotely at iconic locations. 
witnessing the beauty of nature like never before. Sign up to be an explorer and you could win one of these experiences yourself. Visit NatureEye.com today. Sorry for the radio there folks, I was just listening to see if there's any updates for this afternoon. Um, yeah, we're talking about the hippos, super cool, that part of hippo was quite big there on uh, Chitwa, eh? How many hippo did we count in the end? How many did you count, Panda? I counted at least eight or nine hippo. Yeah, somewhere between eight to ten hippo there on Chitwa. Ah, oh, I think we are yeah, definitely guessed between eight and ten but I mean again there were so many of them there that it was kind of difficult to keep up with how many they were there were so many little ears and noses popping out the water that was lovely sighting to have so many hippo oh we've got some arrow marked babblers calling on my left do make quite a racket those arrow marked babblers they're quite common in like urban areas. I don't know if you've heard them flying into your garden and having a good cackle. I'm just talking about how it sounds like a, a group of ladies that have joined together for an afternoon tea, having a good cackle at the week's endeavours. So just a reminder folks about uh, our couples quiz mania if you're looking for something interesting to do on Valentine's Day on the 14th of February. Wow I can't believe it's almost Valentine's Day already. That's crazy isn't it? Um, yeah Wild Earth will be putting the lovers to the test so you're welcome to join us for the couples quiz mania which will be during the sunset safari. You can register in teams of two and name your teams according to your favorite rom-com. So don't miss out. Please head over to our website at wildearth.tv slash quizmania if you would like to register. I am definitely looking forward to the couples mania quiz. It's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, you can see in the water, so have a look. There's a lot of ripples going on there. 
So it was quite cool this morning, the terrapins, there's lots of terrapin activity here at the dam and uh, I think it could be a, could have been because of all the insects from the rain last night and I had my door open and there's definitely a lot of insects that came with the rain. Um, I don't know if any of you at home have the same problem. Um, and yeah, it must have meant there was a lot of kind of flying insects on the top of the water. I know sometimes the elates, the flying termites, will come out during the rain. Uh, anyway, we're still going to keep an eye out on our hippo here at Gauri Dam. But let's head over to Cedric and see what he's found for you. Thank you, Kerry. Yes, we've got a nice male elephant that's feeding here on the clearing. Once again, eating some marulas. We were talking about it today. It's like, where did all the elephants go? And all of a sudden, we're coming out to the big clearing, and there's another male behind us. And we've got this one. Oh, that one almost fell on his head. Do you see a marula coming past there? Mm -hmm. This is so sunny. Yeah. And we're looking tumbling down there. Mm, looks like his tusks are nice and white. I'm sure that he might have been in a, a dam during the during the afternoon having a swim. Even his body is a little bit dark. He might have been one of those elephants that was swimming around there at Gauri Dam earlier on. He's got very white tusks. Yeah, uh, you can see he's still a little bit wet behind the ears as well. Jenna from the UK. Oh, thank you. I'm glad that you got some information on uh, some wildlife here from us. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Jenna from the UK. It has been quite a pleasant day and a little bit hot today, a little bit warm. But other than that, it was very nice. Nice birding. It was quite an interesting gull that I found there, that black kind of uh, ball that was stuck to the branch. I want to go and look that up. I want to see exactly what's happening there because it just seems like some, almost like somebody took tar and painted tar on the outskirts of that mud ball. So, uh, some kind of insect goal that. So yes, quite interesting and nice that Kerry as well made her way first time down towards Chitwa Dam to go and see how Chitwa looks like. It's always good to touch sides, especially if she needs to respond to something one day that side, so that she now she knows exactly where to go. Very important. Lovely. We're just going to stick with this uh, male elephant for the last bit while he is feeding on all these nice sweet marula fruits. That's pretty much lying and resting on the ground, busy ripening up for other animals and for us. I need to collect some nice ripe marula fruits very soon. But yes, thank you so much for all the comments and questions this afternoon. Once again, we do appreciate it. Thanks for joining us as well on a fantastic sunset safari. And tomorrow morning, please join us on Sunrise Safari because I've got a feeling it is going to be wacky, wacky, wacky <laughs> Wednesday tomorrow. Uh, we are going to find some interesting cats tomorrow morning from the Wild Earth Crew. Have a lovely evening. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>